passage today that Bob just read begins the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And as he moves forward to Calvary, as he's looking forward to the cross, he actually reaches back in the past, which is so cool for us because it gives us um, a perspective on God's plan of salvation. So he reaches about 480 years in the past to teach us what's going on today. He, it's a quote from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. I'm told this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. And there it is. And that prophecy proves that this is the long-awaited Messiah. It's not that Jesus had to prove. He does it for our sake, right? And that's what's so beautiful about the scriptures. Not that he has to do this. He is Christ. He is God Almighty. But he does it for us in, in the form of this prophecy in keeping with his eternal plan, in keeping with his salvation and the gracious benefits that he pours out to his people. So you see that connection? That's something that should reach deep into our hearts, man, that, that fulfillment of this wonderful prophecy of Christ for us. He came to bring peace. That's what Christ came for, between a sinful man and a holy God. That was his mission, to reconcile sinners like us to Almighty God, holy and righteous God. Ephesians 2.17 says this, He came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Amen? That's it. Isaiah 53.5 says this, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. This is why Jesus commanded Peter to put away his sword in the garden. Remember what happened in the garden? When they came to, to take Jesus away, Peter got out his sword and he, and he cut off the, the ear of the guard of Melchus. I think this is the guy's name. And what did Jesus do? Yeah, that's it. That's how we're going to conquer them. No, he didn't do that. He said, Peter, put that away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He could have called legions of angels to come down and destroy them, but that's not God's purpose in salvation. He's the prince of peace. His reign as king is not just provincial. It's not just in one little area, but it's universal in scope. He's not just the the savior of the Jews. He is the savior of all people. He is from the Jews, but he's savior of of all people. There's no other way of salvation except through Jesus Christ. And that's why we preach it. And that's why we teach it. And that's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Okay? There's no other way but through Christ. Again, Zechariah 9.10 says this in terms of his kingship. It's universal. He is the king. I will cut off the chariots from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Again, Psalm 22 teaches us this. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. See, it's it's universal in scope. There's no other way of salvation but through Christ. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. That's it, man. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nation. See, that was indicated when Christ was coming in as a prince of peace, not riding on a war horse, but on a, but on a donkey. And that's a symbol of humility and even of peace. Right? That's his reign. That's his scope. His kingdom advances how? Through bloodshed? Do we go around killing people and making them become Christians? No. His kingdom advances through the preaching of the gospel. Go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the remotest parts of the earth. So the kingdom advances as the gospel is preached. Even the inscription over the cross that read King of the Jews, right? That's what that read, King of the Jews. But he's more than just King of the Jews. He's King of the universe. He's King over all. The Gentiles recognized his authority and majesty. And that's symbolized in the, in the centurion at the crucifixion. Remember? What did he say in Matthew 27, 54? The centurion and those who are with him, keeping watch over Jesus, 
saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Even the testimony of the Gentiles is out there that Christ is the Son of God. I wish I could be more enthusiastic this morning, but I'm just like, I'm just saying, because this is so rich and so deep and so wonderful in terms of salvation. He's not just the Savior of a certain ethnic group or of a certain race. He is a Savior of all kinds of people. He is the only Savior. He's not a king who conquers and delivers by spilling the blood of others, right? But he's a king who conquers by his shedding of his own blood, and that's the difference of Christian and Christianity. It's not like the, the Muslims and Islam and, and much of that religion is, is the shedding of blood of others in the name of Allah. No, 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 no. Christ shed his blood for sinners that we may come to him. And again, that's so contrary. When you think of a king, when you think of one coming in, you want him to conquer, you want him to defeat right, with the sword. And, and there were many who wanted Jesus to do that. They wanted to come in and kind of destroy the Romans and get rid of them. They wanted this warrior king. And yet they can't have a king who came on a donkey and gave himself that we might be saved. It seems so contrary. It seems so counterintuitive, right? You want, him, you want to see him defeat the enemies, not die on the cross. And yet, that's the only way, the way that's ordained by the Father. It's about the blood. It's about the price needed to satisfy and appease God's wrath. That removes guilt. That's it. That reconciles sinners. That covers our sin and our shame. That's why Christ came. This is the price of victory over Satan, sin, death, and hell. Not coming in with a sword, not conquering, not destroying or kicking out the Romans, but coming and giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. And all who are called by grace call upon his name. He is the only way of salvation. By his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he shows the kind of king that he is in the nature of his kingdom. Right? It seemed very clearly, I think it seemed very clearly with the two uh, men on the cross. That's why I had the second reading this morning. Um, so let's turn to that. Let's go to Luke um, chapter 23. Because this is the difference in the nature of the kingdom of Christ and the nature of salvation. You have two different perspectives. Jesus, what are you going to do for me so I might believe in you as opposed to Christ, this is what you have done for me, a sinner in need of you. That's, that's the nature of his kingdom, coming to save uh, through his blood. So Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. See, that's the cry of the unbeliever. Save yourself and us. Come down from that cross. Do that now and save us as well. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? Are we, and we indeed, justly, are receiving the due reward for our deeds? But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's amazing, amazing event that takes place on the cross all at Calvary. It's a difference between um, in understanding the kingdom of Christ, right? Because we want, people want this you know, warrior savior to come in and take over, save yourself and save us. But the other one realizes it's not about him. It's all about Jesus. The unrepentant thief thinks about this world. And that's what so many people do. Our friends, our family, co-workers that don't know Christ. It's about this life. Listen, save yourself. Come down from that cross and then we'll believe. Jesus, you need to prove yourself to me and then I'll believe in you. Show me, okay? Show me. Satisfy my questions. We have lots of, fa- even our family members, they're so skeptical. Ske- Thank you. I can't have taken that motor. <laughs> skeptical about Christ. I'm going to start blabbering here. You're not taping this one, are you, Betty? <laughs> right? They're so skeptical about Christ. Prove yourself to me. Be who I think you should be. 
satisfy me, and then I'll believe in you. And sometimes that's just the implicit attitude. People might not say that outright, but that's kind of what's going on in their own hearts. That Jesus, you have to prove yourself to me, and then I'll believe in you. Save yourself and save us. That's what the impenitent thief says on the cross. They don't want to bow the knee to Christ. They want a Christ that they can shape, that they can mold. A Christ created in their own image. They want to have their own life and Christ over here. Okay? So they want it both ways. They don't acknowledge their sin, their need. They hold on to their pride, and they live for this life. Right? Come down from there, king. Prove yourself to me, and then I'll believe in you. That's the way of the world. That's the way of so many people. But you see, when grace comes and grips your heart, and you see yourself for what you truly are apart from Christ, it's a different story. And that's why the second criminal, in contrast, to the, in contrast we have the repentant thief who by the grace of God recognizes that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Nor is he a savior that has to live up to my expectations. Show yourself worthy of my honor and my trust. No. It's me that's the sinner. It's me that's lost. It's me that deserves punishment. It's me who's not worthy of you. Like John said, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. It's me who so desperately needs you. See, that's the difference. And that's how the kingdom of God comes in in Christ and that that love and overwhelms us with his love. So he turns and says to Christ Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, please remember me. Just that simple plea, that, that, that cry of faith to Christ. And amazingly, and this is the deep grace of God, man. This, is, this touches, Jesus, his response is amazing to this person. This person who up until that moment in his life rejected Christ, saw fit to live the life the way he wanted to live it, rejected Messiah. The response he receives is one of forgiveness, assurance, compassion, hope, and of love. See, that's how the kingdom comes. And that's how we're conquered by Christ, through his love. He conquers us with his love through the gospel. That's the victorious king. That's how he comes. What did Jesus say to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, just think about it. This is the grace of God. How can this sinner who was crucified. They didn't crucify just anybody. This had to be a really, really bad person. This was the death sentence. Up until that moment, he couldn't point to anything that he did that was good, that was righteous. Here's what I've done. Here's what, you know, I've I've tried now. He was out of options. He simply turned to Christ in faith and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, we want people to pay for their sin somehow. We want people to like, you know, do something so that so that Christ can accept me, or Jesus, do something so that I might believe in you. He repents of his sin. And Jesus gives this wonderful promise that right now, today, despite all your sin, how you lived your life, even to that moment, you will be with me. In paradise. It almost seems unfair, doesn't it? But that's the grace of God in Jesus Christ. This prophecy is given. It proves and it shows that Jesus Christ is Messiah, that he is king, that he is the promised savior. But the question is not about him and who he is. It's about you. What are you expecting? What he's done or what you want him to to do, who he is or who you want him to be. The answer to those questions is the difference between heaven and hell. He is king. He is savior. He is Lord. Know him.